Wholesale Hotline, where we cover everything to do with wholesale real estate. I'm Jamil Damji. I'm Brent Daniels. And I am Pace Morby. And together we cover the most important parts of wholesale real estate. Lead generation. Conversion of sellers into contracts. And dispositions. Guys, remember when you're watching this show, do us a favor and squad up in the comments. Make sure that you are liking and subscribing to the YouTube channels and in the Facebook group, Wholesale Hotline. Most important, we wanna know we're doing a great job for you and helping you build your business. So go give us a review on iTunes and or Spotify. So squad up and enjoy the show. Jerry, the next time you come into town, we're going to have to reshoot that opening now that uh, now that you are the fourth member of the band. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be fun. Welcome. Welcome to Wholesale to Hotline here, number 214. We are excited today. We're discussing the ultimate debate mm. on market versus be, be it resolved. Who, who's ever mm. uh, participated in an actual debate here? No, not, okay. not a formal debate. A formal debate. It's I feel so, like I have to debate it every always, time I go It always home. starts with be it resolved. Okay. So be it resolved that off-market deals mm -hmm. are better for wholesaling than on-market deals. And then there's a there's an affirmative and a negative. Okay. Uh, affirmative would say that off-market is better. Negative would say that on-market is better. Mm -hmm. Each an affirmative would go, then a negative would go, and then they would each have a rebuttal. Okay. Um, that would be the, the way to go. Now here's the problem. Yeah. I think it's two against one. Cause yeah. I think Jerry and I <laughs> are both, um, uh, champions of on market and, and the agent approach just out of economics and whatnot. You're the champion of off market, of course. Yep. Um, uh, we would have Pace Morby also championing off market cause we all know his opinion on real estate agents. However, uh, Pace is at the Masters right now, yep. so mm -hmm. he's unfortunately unable to join us. So, um, so uh, I'm actually happy that he's not here. So, Jerry, let's just <laughs> kick the crap out of Brent. Let's go. This will be <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun, guys. Put in the comments section if you are watching live. One, where you live, where you're doing business, so that you can squad up in the uh, comments section. Um, I, it doesn't matter if you're on Jerry's channel, Jamil's channel, Pace's channel, or my channel. Um, you can start uh, to uh, open up the conversations with people that are doing this business. And we find that people build really strong relationships in the chat. And also, I want to get your opinion. Is it on market or is it off market uh, that you think is going to win this debate? All right. Awesome. So, all right. Awesome. A positive for on market. Okay. Positive for, for on market. For both you guys. One of the things that I think we, is. Will you explain what on market means? On market means that these are houses that are already listed on the MLS. Okay. So, um, already listed properties. Why I believe they are superior in. And again, this isn't to diminish off market at all because we know that there's a lot of opportunity in off market. There's a lot of opportunity in direct to seller. There's tons of money to be made there. There's it, nobody is nobody's debating that. Right. Um, however, that will always cost you money. It'll always cost you money mm -hmm. to to get in front of a seller, even if it's just you know skip tracing, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you're cold calling yourself, you're not hiring VAs. You're skip tracing and calling them yourself. You know, just getting a list of 10,000 leads off of PropStream or Batch and then skip tracing that's going to be around $1,500. And it's not going to happen in the first month. You're going to have to do it for 90 days. So we're talking $4,500 minimum expense to go direct to seller and cold calling. Now, the beautiful thing about that is return on investment wise, of course, direct to seller is going to always win. You're going to get deeper deals going direct to seller and you're going to make, you're going to hit the ball. You're going to hit more home runs than you are doing agent outreach or buying on market. Why I prefer on market. Uh, first, the, the the seller has already raised their hand saying, I want to sell, right? They've already listed their property for sale. Now, um, knowing that, we can get an understanding of condition right from the photos. Uh, so we know the condition of the property. Mm -hmm. And then we have 
a beautiful thing that tells us about motivation and demand, right? Days on market is a huge piece of data that we get to use to our advantage because mm -hmm. we can see if a house is sitting on the MLS for 90 days, 120 days, that there's no demand for it at its current price. Mm -hmm. And so logically speaking, I can have a, a, a honest conversation with a real estate agent about the likelihood of this house selling at its current price and its current condition. And that honest conversation can lead either to a potential deal or to a moving on, right? Yep. Now, again, here's the beautiful thing about when an agent says to me, I don't like your price, I don't like what you're talking or what you're saying right now, Jamil, usually the reason they're saying that is because they don't know how to have the conversation with their seller. They don't know how to how to lower expectations of their seller, and they don't know how to broach the conversation about the fact that the seller is not going to get the price that the agent promised they'd be able to get them, right? So helping the agent understand or have that conversation and the talking points is very helpful. Um, but back to my original argument, knowing that there's a house to be sold, that they want to sell, getting the data, knowing that days on market are um, going to tell me about demand and motivation, right? Mm -hmm. That is so much predetermined data that I can go in and make the strongest argument possible. And if I'm going to have one shot, right, I'm, I'm tapping into my inner rabbit here. If I got one shot, one opportunity to make all my dreams come true, would you take it or would you let it slip away? Does Jerry know the reference? I mean, he's from Detroit. You got it. Oh, oh got it. come on, oh, God, Jerry. on Eight Jerry. Mile, bro. Eight mile, bro. Eight mile, bro. Mom spaghetti, man. Um, so, so this is why this is why I think, especially if you're new, especially if you're new. Um, going on market is the fastest, easiest, most economical way to test whether or not being a wholesaler is for you. Yes. Because you're not going to make a hefty investment other than your time. And the likelihood of you getting a deal is as high as your commitment to making offers and having conversations. That's right. Conversations and offers. Jerry. I would add to that. Uh, I like I like those points, Jamil. I would add to that. Uh, unlike off market, which is one and done, on market is relationship driven. So if you do it right, I, I always tell people it's never about the deal. It's always about the relationship. So even though we call about a specific listing, we think it's distressed. We think maybe there's an opportunity to buy this at a discount. All of those things to me are secondary. Number one is can I make a connection with this agent? Obviously, they get distressed real estate which means if they've got one listing right now that I'm talking to them about, clearly they're okay to take on distress. They're probably, that's probably a little bit in their market demographic or whatever. They're probably going to talk to other sellers in the future. And I always play the long game. Everything I look at in this business is the long game. So if I can have a, if I can have a relationship with an agent who brings me 10 opportunities a year and I have 25 or 30 of those relationships in my, in a given market, I'm doing deals every single month from those My relationships man. because, yep. because now those agents are going to bring me those opportunities, especially if you can, you create a competitive advantage and you double dip with that agent. Now you're, now you're strategically aligning with those agents on their listings. They're going to be motivated for you to win. They're going to be thinking about you when they get another property. They're going to be calling you. Uh, you know, they they want you to win because they win when you double dip. Right. Uh, and a lot of people think double dip is it's technically dual agency. And we think that that might be limited to just states that do dual agency because there are 12 that don't. But we do it just as much in Texas and Florida. They're non dual agency states because those agents will find a way. They'll either do designated agency with another agent in their office. Yep. They'll either maybe they'll switch the, the agreement to a transaction broker, which means they can now take compensation on both sides and they don't represent either. Like they'll or find they get a way. to build relationship equity with the other agent, right? Like imagine this, Jerry, um, you know, I'm a real estate agent and I get somebody reaching out to me and they want to do dual agency, but I'm uncomfortable with it. Well, if I then say, okay, I, no problem. You don't want to do dual agency. Do you have a friend? Do you have somebody that you'd like to bless with this opportunity? Now think about it. This agent, they'll always have a friend. They'll always have somebody that they'll want to refer business to. 
that's relationship equity. They're just as motivated to have the deal work with that person as they'd be with themselves because they don't want to bring a client to a friend for that deal to cancel. No, yeah. no, they yeah. don't. They want to see that friend make that money. Yeah. So you're, you're leveraging relationship equity and it's just as good as dual agency in my opinion. Yeah. And so the, the, the most important thing that, that I say, Jamil and everybody listening to this, Brent is, the most important part of that conversation with an agent is not about, hey, can I make an offer on this listing right now? That's great. Like that gets us on the phone. But the most important thing is to say, hey, in the future, if you get distressed real estate like this, if you get a property where the seller is motivated, maybe they don't want to put some work into it. It's look, you're looking for a cash and buyer investor. Uh, will you call me before you even list it? You know, I'll help you run numbers on it. I'll help you get to a good price. I'll make an offer for you. I'll make the job easy for you. Who knows? Maybe we'll work it out where you don't even have to bring it on market. I'm a buyer. Save me in your phone as, you know, Jerry Cash buyer. Call me when you get deals like this. And then if you do a good job following up with those agents and you're front of mind, then the next time they get one of those, maybe you're not competing with everybody else. And maybe you can have an inside, you know, on those deals. So that's to me, that's probably more important than any of this because that's going to turn into repeat deals. Amen. One thing that I've been using, Jerry, that works really well is, is framing them in a, a situation they already understand. So many agents have an understanding on how Open Door and OfferPad have taken opportunities from them. Mm -hmm. And so I use the example of, hey, by, by letting me know next time you have one of these opportunities, there's going to be people that you're talking to that went and sold to Open Door and OfferPad what I'm giving you is an opportunity to compete because if you can generate a cash offer faster and better and mm -hmm. higher than offer pad and open door, you can take all of that business that you've had to lose. And so they automatically understand what I'm saying because they're like, Oh yeah. Oh, Oh my God. Oh, I remember. I remember. I remember losing this one. I remember losing that one. I remember mm -hmm. this one where it hits home. I wish I'd had a, ca a cash opportunity. I wish I had a cash solution. So you're leveling the agent up. You're giving the agent another tool, just as Jerry is talking about. Now you become the permanent fixture in that agent's tool belt, right? They can go to any listing appointment and they've got a little Jerry Norton in their tool belt. And they're like, hey, I got exactly what's going to solve the problem right now. It's this man right over here. He is no nonsense. He'll, he'll give us a cash offer. It'll be, it'll be very competitive. It's going to be 100% of as-is value which is important for them to understand. We're not lowballing here. We're not stripping equity. Our equity doesn't happen until we make an investment into the house. So I'll give 100% of as is value. And now all of the boxes are checked. Fiduciary duty, check. Uh, client gets mo mo most money, check. Convenience, check. I make more money, check. I All of these boxes that are the agent's Think about it. When anytime you meet somebody, you have an imaginary box. You have imaginary boxes you're checking off in your head. Our brains naturally do this. This is how we this is how we diminish information so that we can understand the world in a more efficient way. And every time we meet somebody, every time you talk to somebody, your brain is subconsciously checking boxes to let you know if this is somebody that you should talk to or not. So check the boxes for them. You, we know what the agent's boxes are. Let's just give them the conversation that naturally checks the boxes. I love all that. I think that, listen, one of the hardest parts about this business is what is a lead? What is a lead? And, and just to simplify it, a lead is somebody that has made the decision they're going to sell their property. That's a lead. Because you could go creative if they want too high of a price. If they want speed and convenience, you can go with a cash option. But when you're going direct to seller, you're going to talk to a lot of people that have not made the decision that they're ready to sell. True. Right? And then sometimes we get into the rhythm of trying to convince people it's the right time right. to sell, which never, never works. works. So when it's on the market and they've signed all the documents, which is probably 20 to 30 pages of documents that a, a property owner has to uh, go through to put their property on the market, they've made the decision. Yeah. If somebody gives them the right amount of money with the right terms, they're going to sell that property. So is it safe to say that so, you're on board with what we're no. saying? For, for a couple of different reasons. <laughs> so 
Okay. This is this is this is a, I'm going to give <laughs> I, I've got a couple things here. All right. All right? <laughs> Number one, in 2010, I was bidding down at the foreclosure auctions at yep. the trustee sales. We have we're we're a deed of trust state, so we have trustee sales, not um, uh, mortgages. And so uh, these are these are the foreclosure auctions. And I would see people that would buy these properties at basically, you know, retail value. I mean, the retail was going down and down and down because it was a story. It mm. wasn't on the market. You can't even find these properties. You don't know anything about these properties. There's an allure to properties that are unlisted. There's a story that could be told at barbecues for years and years and years and years. And I saw it time and time and time again, buyers would be coming in just because they wanted to buy properties that were off market. And now what's happened is we've got a lot of wholesalers out there that are, they're, they're, they're working, they're building some momentum in their business, but they're not really good at comping mm -hmm. and they grab a property, they put it under contract and they send it out to cash buyers. Cash buyers are like, bro, this isn't, this isn't even close to a deal. Right. I, you're, you're not even close to this. And it's almost, in my opinion, what I've seen with, with the buyers that we've worked at is they, they won't even look at a property if it's on market. Some cash buyers. Some, some, right? not, not yeah. all of them. I think the, the buyers that we can count on closing, coming to title, yeah. putting the EMD down quickly, knowing what a hard money lender is, knowing who their hard money lender is, understanding all of that. Those are repeat buyers. Mm -hmm. Repeat buyers know there are, properties there are good deals on the mls and so convincing them that a good opportunity exists being listed is not really a difficult hill to climb just depends on how beat up they are reviewing bad deals but I, yes I would, yes I would agree, one of the Brent. things i mean i run into that I, I think i think there's definitely a cash buyer in the market that if it's on market for whatever reason the number could, the deal could pencil but they just have sort of like a that's eh, not really a deal. I could have bought it or, you know. Well, Jerry, not... what about a big gap from list price to contract? Or... You're that's okay. Now yeah. You're See, that's, but that's what I'm saying is if, some, if a house is 90 days on market, there's no chance you're locking this up at list right. price, right? Have you have to be right so below list price yeah. uh, and then send it out so below list price. Your sale price has to be, there has to be such a gap in value there that you will just naturally have somebody comp it for you. Yeah. naturally a buyer will comp it because they'll be like, wait, this thing's listed for 600 and he sent it out for 390. Yeah. What's happening? We have one right now, Jamil, you'll get a kick out of this. So Punta Gorda, Florida, 250 list Hold price. On, where? 150, Punta Gorda, Florida. I thought that was a new dish at Taco Bell. No, no, that's, okay. uh, it's not a that's Punta that's Gordita. Gordita. Yeah. Okay. okay. Punta Sorry, Gordita. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> list price is 250. We have a contract for 156. Sure. Amazing. So, you know, asking a cash buyer to pay 176 on a 250 list, that's not a hard argument to make. Exactly. Exactly. So but as long as, as, long as you're comping, two. as long as you're, which again, guys, if you are having a hard time comping, I, I hate to self-promote, but I do twice a week. Yeah. I'm, I'm putting service out there for everybody. I straight out of comping Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. And Sunday at 4 p.m. Pacific, I will comp your deals live using the appraisal rules. I get it. I can comp a house in 30 seconds. I'm very good at it. And I'll show you exactly how I comped it so that you can go and practice yourself. I verbalize the decision making that my mind is doing while I'm coming up with the numbers. So if you're having a hard time determining value, please subscribe to my channel. Come to Straight Outta Compton and learn learn yeah and it, and it is and it is re in relation to list price a lot of it like for example we have another deal where it came out really underpriced and we ended up going over list price and there were like 50 people at the house i mean it was hot we got it because we were fast we double dipped we did all the right things and we got the deal but uh now taking that to dispo we know right out of the gate about half my buyers Half of the buyers in the marketplace are just going to say no, no because they're going to see list price. They're going to see the price we're disappointed at. And it's yep. just going to be a turnoff for whatever reason. I think it's yep. stupid because the numbers should stand alone, but it's just how it is. And so we just know we have that challenge on that one, even though the price we're bringing it to the cash buyer market is a good deal. It's significantly you know below value. Yeah, but it just happened to be 
listed aggressively low. And, you know, here we are. So everyone's just got to understand what you're up against, right? So like, imagine you're taking a deal to your cash buyer. The cash buyer is going to Google it. They're going to see it's listed. And what experience are they going to have? What thoughts are they going to have? And how can you overcome them? How can you help mm -hmm. them see that? So I'll say to the cash buyer, say, look, this thing was listed, but it was listed really far. We had to beat out a bunch of other people. It's still an yep. awesome deal. Here's ARV. Here's repair number. You do your own due diligence, but this is an awesome deal. Don't, don't worry that it's, it was listed. You know, we did all the work to get the deal. Here it is. And, you know, like overcome that objection. But Brent, I think you're right. It's definitely something that some cash buyers have a real problem with. The other part is appraisers use listings. They do. When it was listed, what it was listed for yep. <clears throat> on the appraisals. Yep. If it was unlisted, they have they, they don't have to do so much justification for the increase in value. Well, they don't they're actually not allowed. So this is this is one of the things. This is one of the reasons why I ask listing agents not to put the house on the MLS mm -hmm. um, before giving it to me. Right. Um, so you know anybody here that's so you doing like off market deals? Then? I do love off market uh -huh. deals. I mean, brother, <laughs> be it resolved. Okay, but hold on, hold on, hold on. Agent outreach. Let's let's yeah, let's agent outreach is a strategy for off market deals. Yes. Um, I know. I'm just talking about. A lot of people, when you're starting out, you see a deal on the MLS, yeah. you see it's it's lower, it's been on the market, it's beat up, and you see, you know, oh, I'm going to make an offer on this. Yeah. And then, you know, it kind of, you know, in my in my experience with, with the students that I've worked with, um, they have to get it significantly under. Yes, sir. That's the only route yes, if it's listed on the market. A freshie, like Jerry just said, a freshie, a yeah. freshly listed, well-priced home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the two strategies I'll typically do is I'll just buy it, close it, and yep. then yep. send it out so yep. that it's no longer on market. Uh, and then they'll see it was listed, went pending same day, closed same week, and then I won't aggressively resell it. I'll be very conservative mm -hmm. on my profit margin mm -hmm. because they'll see it recorded at, say, 150, and then I'm sending it out at 169.9. They're like, I can do that. Mm -hmm. They don't yeah. have a problem with that. So we're talk about what happens in the appraisal. Yeah. So if it's a fix and flip. Okay. So this is different it's, when a it's a big final. problem. It's right. a big, the, these price stamps, these MLS price stamps, they do bone your buyers. That's why it's very important when you have these conversations with listing agents to say, look, don't bone don't, my buyers. Yeah, no, don't, don't put me in a situation. Look, I'll pay you more money than I would be able to pay you if you give it to me before you list it, mm -hmm. I will add an additional $10,000 onto what my offer would be. If you give it to me pre-list, because when you put this on the MLS, you create a price stamp. And even though appraisers aren't supposed to use that in their determination of value, they do. Mm -hmm. And lenders do. Mm -hmm. And lenders choose appraisers that work that into their valuation system. So, do me a favor, do yourself a favor and your client a favor. I will give you more money if you give me the opportunity prior to listing it and keep it off the MLS. And that argument works. Mm -hmm. And and if they're like, wait, hold on. And I'll say, how many times have you been in a been in a fix and flip situation with a buyer and had it under appraised because of what it was, what they paid for the property? Appraisers don't know how much things cost. Look, appraisers still give you 10 grand of value for a pool. For a who's, pool. who's built a pool for ten thousand dollars? <laughs> Yeah, good luck. <laughs> right? It's, crazy. it's yeah, it's nuts. The other thing, so, and I tell this story because I think it just really sums up the opportunity. But Jerry, I got a call off of a mailer in 2018, so it's been a little while. And the gal said, "Come on over, I want to sell my property, the whole thing." My uh, acquisition manager went, and uh, she called me in like a. a like she was so nervous. She was like, I, I don't know what's happening here. I need you to come down and, uh, and meet with this, meet with this seller. And I was like, what is going on? This acquisition manager has been on dozens of appointments has, has done a bunch of deals, a uh, newer, but, but not, not green. And so I go down there and Fran was the seller and she wanted to, I looked at the Zillow estimate on the way there. It was in South Phoenix and, she, and the estimate was $220,000. And I got there and she wanted $9,000. She wanted $9,000 for her house. And I said, listen, 
Um, have you sold any houses before? And she said, yeah, I've been a broker for 20 years with Century 21. And I said, well, what do you think you could put it on the market and sell it for? She said, oh, probably 200,000. It wasn't even that beat up, Jerry. And I said, so why are you giving me $191,000 worth of equity? And she goes, I have no one else to give this property to. I have no siblings. Um, I just go to church. I've got my, my, my house paid off. I got my car paid off. I just, you know, I just don't want the property and I want to do something for a young real estate person. Wow. Right. <laughs> like that. Right. Wow. I just want, I just want you to, she, she literally told me, I just want you to win big. And I was like, I don't feel good about this. I'm going to, I need you like, I need to talk to an attorney. Yeah. She had her, she had her estate attorney wow. get me on the phone. She wow. said, I, I have, I have told her not to do this. I got, I went down and <laughs> I, she, she told me she went down to, um, St. Something's uh, a Catholic church down the way and met with the priest. And I went and talked to the priest and he said the same thing. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know what other excuse. No, you, like, you, I, you do the deal, you do the deal and you, you know, drive her to church until she passes away. Right. I mean, right? she like, wasn't, she's not, she wasn't that old. You know what I mean? What, like, what'd you she do? Was, she was just, so I bought the deal. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, your, Leonard Wells asked, what's your point, what's your point what, with the, that, Brent? The, the, the point is, you're not going to get that on market. The, the point is, there's no way that happens on market. The point is, okay. the deal of a lifetime comes around once a week. It's the absolute well, fact. Here's what, what I done. here's. Go ahead, go ahead sorry, Brent. No, go oh, ahead. I was just gonna I was just gonna add to that. I was gonna say there is some truth to that. Like uh, on market, typically, you know, like a 10k is a, is a typical win. You know, every now and then you can get a big one, but you got to remember there is an agent there, and they are going to protect some of that equity. Of course, and, and there's. The urgency isn't as high as an off-market lead, some off-market leads, because yep. clearly they have time. They're listing it. So they got time, a little bit of time on their hands. Well, we typically see it's a disinterested seller and they list it and they're not paying attention to it. They're not aggressively dropping the price. Yeah. It's inherited or it's a tired land, some kind of thing going on where they, they just don't want to deal with it more than they're like, you know, hurting for cash is typically what we'll see. Still distress, though, still poor condition and all the things. But that agent is going to protect some of that equity. Yes. And so like you're never going to get like these massive, you know, discounts on market like you do off market. You know, it's yep. nothing well, like if a PPC you do, it gets rate. bid up, Jerry. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. And 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 I think that I was the only postcard. Actually, clearly, she called another company yeah. that didn't come out. Wow. And then she called us. She called two postcards that she had in a stack of mail. And uh, and we went out. So as we, you know, said in the first, you know, the opening of the argument that mm -hmm. that off market will always will always give you juicier checks. It's yeah. a it's a fact. Right. Look, Keegley's average profit margin right now is like thirteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Right. We're, it's, it's, just, it's it's like twelve thousand and something, almost thirteen thousand. That's our average deal. And the majority of our deals are are either. Uh, off market agent opportunities mm -hmm. through agent outreach, JV opportunities from other wholesalers, and then the occasional, I'd say probably out of the 60 ish, 70 ish deals we'll do in a month, nine, eight to nine of those will be on market, but yeah. they'll be sub substantially below yeah. list price and they sell immediately. Like those, those opportunities go all the time. So having a good mix, I think, I think. If you're just getting started, and I'll, I'm, I'm happy for both of you guys to refute or add to this, but if you're just getting started using agent outreach, using um, a very strategic uh, uh, approach on, on market mm -hmm. and very highly specialized off-market lists, mm -hmm. Um, like the platform you 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 work with and the platform I work yep. with, Deal Junkie. These yep. platforms are really good because you can get AI generated off market opportunities that that are very 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 um, pain point driven, right? So these guys are they're they're checking whether or not somebody's canceled a mail subscription or a magazine subscription if they've changed their phone number, if they've changed their mailing address, if somebody in the household has passed away or gone to college, all of these factors become uh, pain points that make this property more likely to sell in the next 90 days. And you can take, 
your average prop stream or batch list, which is typically 1% of those in that list will be ready to sell. And you can move that up to like 16, 17%, right? And so I think that is how, or you do, you know, a, a program like Jerry's find me a deal mm -hmm. program, right? Where Jerry's your buyer, right? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, that's and Jerry don't give a smack if you have a, if the deal is listed on the MLS. He's just buying deals, right? Yeah. So that, that I mean that's a phenomenal opportunity right there too. So I mean, I think a good blend. I think having a good blend as a new wholesaler is the way to go. Having going at this with like, okay, I'm just I'm 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 I. Although specializing is a good thing, especially in the beginning, but having a good blend especially you've gotten one deal under your belt, two deals under your belt. And now you're like, okay, how do I do this at scale? How do I do this as a business model? You've got to dip your toes into a few different pools. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, on market by far, if you're brand new and you have zero marketing budget, one of the best ways to get started all the way up to three to five deals a month. What I found is once you're doing, I've got some students that do about 300 to 400,000 a year, all, all agent, all agent, mm -hmm. zero marketing budgets, mm -hmm. but they're running a, they're running a, you know, quite, a, I mean, they're talking to every single agent in the market and they're, they're following up like create, like they're really got it dialed in. But at some point there's only so many agents and so many listings True. that you'll be able to go to. So you're going to hit a scale issue where you're going to be forced to go off market as you build your business. Yep. But guys, that's, that's usually like down the road a little ways. What's amazing is think about it. If you could do three to five deals a month and you're doing seven to 10,000 a deal or, or get to where Jamil's at 13,000 with zero marketing budget, you got a legit business. Like that's pretty yeah. amazing with, with no marketing budget. That's pretty cool. I mean, we and built a I business found, doing a, over a million dollars a month in assignments with no marketing spend. That's pretty wild. Yeah. yeah and I tell people, that's my experience is this. If you're calling listed properties, so there's you can outreach just any agent and have a conversation. But if you're calling on listed properties, you're doing the double dip, you're doing that right, and you're very strategic. I think it takes about a hundred offers to get your first deal uh, or less. And I put that challenge out. I tell people, look, make five offers a day, twenty-five a week. That's a hundred a month. You will get a deal. It just, you will. All the stars will align. You'll hit the right seller, the right agent, everything at the right time, and you'll get that discounted property. That you wholesale for 10 grand and so guys it's just that's just now like go do the work guys you don't it's have to spend any statistics, money right it's just, just statistics like statistically yeah. speaking what jerry's saying is fundamentally true it it is you 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 make a hundred offers one of them is going to stick right and not only that but let's look at it from a cosmic point right god universe whatever you oh, want to yeah. call it We'll see your tenacity. We'll see you putting it all out there and we'll reward you for it. Yes. Guys, the person who, who shows up every single day gets the blessing. That's right. Jerry, I Jerry, think it's more about that, just showing up and God rewards you for putting in the work. Amen. Definitely. Let me ask you this, Jerry. So do you call the agent on every offer you put in? Yes. Will so you, I'm will you big, talk I'm about a, the importance there? Because yeah. this, this oh, is the two parts yeah. to my oh, neon my sign God. here in my People office. sending out blind offers or blind yeah. LOIs? Yeah, there's these, there's these bots that'll blast them all together. out. Or like I have a, I have my my 19-year-old son. He hates talking to the agent, so he just texts them. And he gets so far with texting. And then at some point, like, dude, get on the phone. Like, what are you doing? And people try to like shortcut this, but the agent model is very relationship driven and you want it to be, it's about the relationship. You got to call. Now I'm okay. If you're following up a little bit with some text and some email, but even then, if you're, I, I think you touch point those agents, you know, every week or two, if you're trying to build momentum in your market and you've got a pool of agents that are open to working with you and they get distressed properties, dude, make that part of your calls to just call those agents say, Hey, here I am. I got, we're looking to buy. I got cash. Are you, do you have anything? Do you have anything? Do you have anything? Pretty soon they're going to be like, they're going to sit down with a seller and they're going to be like, man, this is a perfect investor deal. Who, who should I, what do I do? Oh yeah. Jerry Norton's buying. And they call Jerry Norton, you know, like that's what you want to have happen. And that doesn't happen with texting and email in my opinion, for the most part. I, 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 I agree. you you, you start, you have to have a mix of, of, person-to-person -person contact, 
Um, you've also got to stand out. Your 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 mm -hmm. follow up messages can't be. They just can't be boring. They can't get lost in the shuffle. They can't be, hey, anything to look at this week? Like, guys, come on. Use your personality, mm -hmm. right? Use your, your, your conversation skills. Like, figure that out, mm -hmm. right? What, what, how, would you, how would you stand out? I mean, aside from just texting it in all caps, how do you stand out? Mm -hmm. you, you stand out by being a personality. You stand out by being funny. You stand out by, by saying something that's, that is, is uh, you know, relationship-driven. Do, do you know the number one factor that I've seen amongst the, the best of yours that, that have come into the Rhino tribe and, and, and what we really instill is – speed of response oh my goodness Absolutely. speed of response i don't care if you fumble and stumble i don't care if you don't know how to use the spell check on your phone <laughs> i don't care if you're using a samsung and in, instead of an apple uh if you respond quickly when people send you communicate with you you will win guaranteed yeah. I am telling you, it is the most underrated skill, underrated factor that people don't understand. I remember how fast you were, like in the heyday. You were like I'm still, guns, I'm guns still that fast. fast. Monique sends me an address, dude. Within five minutes, she has a buy price. Right. Yeah. Within yeah, five but, but minutes. You respond back. Got it. Checking it out yep. now. But that's it. And that's what I'm, I'm on this. On it. Like, guys, you know how often I write on it? My phone will automatically like knows that I'm gonna write on it. Like on it is that's my <laughs> standard reply to any agent sending me an opportunity on it. I look at I look at people's cell phones, yeah. bro, and they have like 400 unread text messages. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Jerry? Mm -hmm. Right. Like unread text messages. People wow. are just like nothing in and, this business. And real and estate the thing agents, too. real estate investors. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we and, doing? And the thing is, is agents are not nearly as sophisticated as wholesalers. Like you would think that they would save your number. They would. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, hey, you remember me? Hey, I'm. this is my fifth time talking to you, making offers on your deals. I don't remember you. It's like, how could you not? Why are you not calling me? Why am I finding this online? You know, like you have to take this really by the reins and you got to be so proactive with agents there. Don't assume they're going to remember you. Don't assume. No, they your will your never history. remember you. They will. Even though you're saying things that are standing out, even though you're fun, even though your text messages are engaging and fun, they will still forget you. That's why having being top of mind, um, yeah. we know by the thousands of deals we've done that an agent will typically take eight to 13 touches before they'll produce fruit, right? Eight to 13 touches and follow-ups before they're going to give you an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. So how many times do you have to call that person and be like, Hey, remember me, I'm right here. I'm right here. Eight to 13 times guys tattoo that on your forehead put it somewhere like that you'll never forget when you make that first call to the agent remember you're going to talk to that person eight to 13 more times before you're going to get an opportunity that's, that's just funny fact. you say that jamil i i read a statistic from the national association of sales so this is like sales in general right yep and they said that that they did this study and they said that 80 percent of sales are made between the fifth and 12th follow-up wow so it's right in line with what you're right saying. Right in line with what we're saying, 100. percent And that's so. Then you can see that these that these ratios they're universal at a level, right? Yeah. Sales in general are it's a universal technique. It's a universal process. Yeah. And so whether or not we're talking houses, cars, mm -hmm. widgets, mm -hmm. um, um, rhino um, uh, figurines, okay. statues. Um, they're going to require follow-ups and it's going to take that, that process. And that's and not an on-market thing. That's just a sales thing. That's off-market on-market. Yes, that's sir. just a people thing. Really? That's yes, an sir. entrepreneur thing. Yeah. That's a, you, <laughs> that's making an impact thing. If you want to go out and make money outside of your nine to five of people going, Hey, this is how you can provide value to the world. Here's this job that you have. Okay, great. If you want to do this for yourself, I am telling you respond fast and have yeah. some positivity to it. Mm. Have so, some like 
love behind it. You yeah. know what I mean? Okay. So, you have so that. Can I share, it shocks people. Can I share another reason why I like on market? Yes, sir. So with on market, you never talk directly to the seller. And I actually love that because now it's all business. It's all numbers. It's all relationship with that agent. Uh, I don't have to put my empathy hat on, right? I don't have to cr let the seller cry on my shoulder. I don't have to really find out like, okay, well, what's going on here? None of that even matters anymore because like Jamil said in the very beginning, they want to sell, it's for sale. So now it's really just like, okay, how do I create these connections, enough of them? How do I make a relationship with this agent? And at the end of the day, my number's my number. Whatever's going on in the seller's life, they're going to take it or not take it or counter it or whatever. But it's so refreshing to just go at this business with my head down and just not have to get into that, uh, you know, sympathetic, empathetic role that we definitely have to do with off market. So when I'm wearing my off market hat, I'm all about, okay, we're not even going to talk about the property. I got to first build trust with this person. I got to help them feel like I care. I got to, I got to really, and I got to work on that because it doesn't come natural for me. So I got to kind of like, you know, focus on the person here and their, their experience and their connection to the property, all those things. With on, with on market, you don't really have to do all of that. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the difference I think in the earned income. That's why I think the checks are bigger. There's way more emotions involved. There's way yeah. more problem solving involved. There's yeah. no nobody there that's walking them through it like an agent would, um, unless it's an attorney or something. We we run across that a lot, especially with inherited and probate deals, um, but. Yeah, when you're going in there and the, the house is destroyed and there's dead animals and the, the somebody has smoked a million and a half cigarettes inside this place and the windows are broken and there's... Or they lost their everywhere. job or somebody died, you know, like there's hard yeah. things going on. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just a lot. There's, there, there's, there's a lot more when you're going direct to seller. But I, I think that the, the reward for that is is higher. I think yeah. that you get an emotional award for hell, uh, reward from from helping somebody out of that situation. I think that's why a lot of people and and, and you you go into you know you could do this. You could literally go out in and and find the thousand worst properties in whatever market you're in, and get the addresses. Look up True People Finder or whatever white pages anything online. You could get their phone number. You can get their contact information. You can knock on their door. You can send them a handwritten note. You can send them an offer that's just going to open the doors to a conversation. Mm -hmm. You can do that for, for very, very little budget, if not zero budget. That's what I did. I mean, I had nothing going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So, I mean, yep. driving for dollars, getting those, you know, looking for those properties that need significant investment and just, you know, reaching out to the property. Dri driving for dollars. Is, let's just be clear. Driving for dollars is still mm -hmm. one of the greatest mm -hmm. ways for a uh, starting real estate investor. The only problem is, is that if you have a W-2, it's difficult to do. Yeah. So it's just a very time consuming approach right but driving for dollars people have time hands people down have time. hands have down 68 hours a week. yeah people find the time people find the time people it, don't it, want to be written that that have that 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 brain that different brain that's like i'm not gonna just yeah. watch tv yeah. and you know lay in on on the couch or you know just stay in my dark house all the time the people that are watching this the people that are involved in our in our life they're they, they got that fire yeah they you do. know they yeah. got lightning in their yep. fingertips they got you know sparkles in their eyes and they're ready to go out and do something special so people have the time it's just not as efficient as looking online. Yeah, it, it, seeing, and it's hard to scale. It's hard to scale driving for dollars. But, you know, getting your first deal uh, and especially on low budget kind of situation, driving for dollars is is very, 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 very good. Uh, I want to very quickly just speak to Leonard Wells. He said, how do you get around the proof of funds? Uh, Leonard, I have I've got a um, I have a, a, a million dollars that I have in a bank account. Where, that I keep untouched to help you with that. You email flipfundllc at gmail.com. I will provide you a proof of funds, okay? So flipfundllc at gmail.com. I will provide you a proof of funds so that your offers are legit. The agents even call me, and I call them back, and I verify your proof of funds. These are the things I want you guys to know, though, okay? this You have to be very clear to the agent why you're buying the house, 
You, these are not for owner occupied properties. These are not for uh, uh, houses that are in uh, good condition. All of you guys that are using my proof of funds and sending it to houses that have been fully remodeled, mm. stop it. <laughs> because you look dumb when I tell the agent that this house is, is it a fix and flip? Is it, what, what is it, what are they doing? Well, they're like, no, I think they're going to live in it. Don't do that. Because I will tell the agent that I don't loan on owner occupied houses. So they have, you got to, you have to know what you're doing here. When you're going to provide an agent with a proof of funds, you are looking for an off, you're looking for a house that requires a tremendous amount of work or is an original condition and that you're doing it for an investment purpose. If that, if you have clearly expressed that email flipfundllc at gmail.com, I will provide you a proof of funds. Jerry, Natasha, please put that in the chat for people. Jerry, will you help Paula out here? Very green to this. How do we find buyers for our deals? What happens if we don't find a buyer? Yeah, great question. So my favorite, my favorite method is, I call it the neighborhood flipper method, but what I do is your best buyer on any deal is going to be a local active investor already investing in the same neighborhood as your deal. Because all flippers and buy and hold investors, they like to do deals where they're already doing deals, right? Because they've got it all dialed in. They know their neighborhoods, they know their markets. And so what I do is I just simply, wherever my deal is, is I want to, I want to go back online and I'm going to look up, okay, well, who's flipping houses? What are some sold flips? I know they're flips because they're fully renovated, they're vacant and they're sometimes staged. So, okay, that's a flip. Uh, that investor who's two streets over might want my deal and, or it's active. It's an active flipper. Maybe they're thinking about their next deal, or maybe I'll also look at stuff that's really low price, like the bottom of the market because that's probably an investor who bought that. And now they're in the process of fixing it up. Maybe they're thinking about their next deal. Yep. So I'm going to go to those, those uh, investors right there near my property, the closer to my property, the better. And I'm just going to reach out to them and I'm going to say, Hey, I got this property. Maybe you're interested. Come take a look at it. And one thing I do a little different, I don't know if everybody does this, but what I like to do is I don't skip trace or look up the, the investor directly. You, you could do that. But what I do is I simply call up the agent who listed the property for that flipper and I go directly to them and they're highly motivated to get their investor another deal because they're bringing yeah. value. They're going to get the relist that on the back end and they will gladly take their investors to your properties and, and you don't have to compensate them. They'll, they'll do it because they want their investor to get another deal. And well, you compensate is, them as well and you've even got more motivation. So just work the agent in, right? It doesn't have yeah. to be a full two, 3%, you can give them a five, 10 K, whatever yeah. that is. And they're, cause they know they're going to get the listing on the back end there. So it's, it's, you're just teeing it up. And I want to add to Jerry's checklist of how, how to know it's a flip. When you get to the primary bedroom, there's no clothes in the closet. Yeah. And they always show you the primary bedroom closet. Mm -hmm. They all pick a good listing agent will always have a photo of the primary bedroom closet. If there's clothes in the closet, it's a lived in home. If there's no clothes in the closet and there's furniture in the house, that's a staged yep. flip. Yep. Do you, do you have anybody that could help uh, dispo any deals around the country? Yes, I do. Actually, if uh, Paula also, if you want to reach out to uh, me on DM on IG, I'm happy to connect you with my 118 franchises across the country that will help you dispo your deals. Uh, in addition to that, I'm sure that there are people in the Rhino tribe. I'm sure there's people in the Flipping Mastery tribe who could also gladly help you. Um, the Sub2 community is extremely active in, in helping Dispo opportunities as well, and as is the Astro Flip. Let me just say this, Paula. You are in the right place right now because you're surrounded by the cream of the crop in the world of wholesale. Every one of our, every one of our communities has gangsters in them who will absolutely knock it out of the park for you. So you've shown up to the, you've shown up to the right place. I would, I would also add this Paula. Um, oftentimes we think about step two before step one. Right. And, and we're like, well, you know, I got to have all the steps before I take any steps. And I would try really hard not to do that. I would walk a little in the dark and I would focus on getting a good deal. And I've never had a good deal that I couldn't dispo. Now I've had bad deals I couldn't dispo, but I've never had yeah. a good deal that I couldn't dispo and I couldn't dispo it quickly. So maybe, you know, there's other ways around doing this, but maybe focus on getting a good deal first and then, you know, reach out to any one of us or, 
you know, that you can JV a good deal anytime. That's easy. So I kind of have a philosophy. It's a little different than what some people teach, which is the hardest part is getting a deal because a good deal sells itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to worry so much about the, the, the dispo side. I'm going to worry about getting a good deal and put my energy there. And then once I get a good deal, I know I can move it very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, Paula, watch out for the three P's, right? Paralysis by analysis, perfectionism, and procrastination, mm. All right? Massive, imperfect action wins every time. Wins the day, Paula. So go out there and find some really great opportunities. And, uh, and anybody here in the chat can help you out. I'm telling you. You know, but somebody knows somebody that, that, that works in your market for sure. I want to, I want to very quickly go through this list. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been reading the book, the creative act by Rick Rubin and mm -hmm. phenomenal book. And in there, creative act. The, okay. uh, the creative act by Rick Rubin, he comes up with 20 reasons or 20 uh, I, excuses that people make to stop them from taking action. Let's go. Uh, so here they are. Okay. Number one, believing you're not good enough. Number two, feeling like you don't have the energy that it takes to create or do what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Number three, mistaking adopted rules for absolute truth, mm -hmm. right? Number four, Huge. laziness slash not wanting to do the work. Number five, settling, not taking your work to the highest expression that it has. Mm. Six, having goals so ambitious that you never start. Number seven, thinking that you can only do your best under certain conditions. That's what we're talking about here. Like I need to know everything. I need to know who my buyer is. I need to have a red light on. I need to be wearing my uh, purple thong. Um, that's just me. I, I, that's, I have to wear my, but you know what I'm saying? Um, these, these, <laughs> these certain conditions, these magic conditions are not always going to line up. Right. So thinking that you need to have them is kind of crazy. Number eight, requiring specific tools or equipment to do the work. Like I can't do my job as a wholesaler if I don't have privy or I can't do my job as a wholesaler if I don't have batch or prop stream. Yes, you can. You can comp on Zillow. You can do and use free tools. Mm -hmm. You can use Flipster, whatever. There are tools out there that prop you can wire. use. Prop wire. You can use these tools that are legit and free that will help you. So please don't think you need to have all of these special things in order to get it done. Number nine, abandoning the work the moment it gets difficult. Oh, I know how many of you I'm talking to right now. Number 10, feeling like you need permission from somebody to start. Oh, you have permission. How's that? Number 11, letting a perceived need for money, equipment, or support stop you. Number 12, having so many ideas you don't know where to start. That's a big one for all of you shiny object people, and I think that's going to be the majority of us here. I've had shiny object. Jerry's had it. Brent's had it. We've all come down with that condition. And real estate is so versatile that you're going to have a lot of flavors to lick. It's like Baskin and Robbins over here. So that's that's definitely an issue. Number 13, never finishing what you start. Number 14, blaming circumstances or people for interfering in your process. Number 15, romanticizing your negative habits or addictions mm. oh remember how fun it is when you got drunk all weekend long and how great that was and how much fun you've had not making money number 16 <laughs> believing that certain moods or a state is required for you to do your best work oh i just don't feel like it today i'm in a bad mood number 17 prioritizing other responsibilities over your commitment to doing your work how many of you guys are saying, oh, my God, my kids, the this, the that, the this, the that. But guess what happens when you get home? The Netflix. Number 18, distractibility or procrastinating. Come on, man. TikTok, IG, all the things you guys are getting yourself sucked into, they're, they're, they're stopping you. Number 19, impatience. Pace calls it planting a seed and screaming at it to grow. Number 20, <laughs> thinking anything that is out of your control is in your way. I love that one. Thinking anything that is out of your control is in your way. Guys, if it's out of your control, it's not in your way. It's not in your way because you can move to the side and do something else. You can try something. If something is in your way, then find the uh, be water. Find the path. You, you don't have to stop because something is in your way. There's always a way under, around, over, through all the things. Um, anyways, I, I found those 20, that list of 20, just so, so brilliant. Rick Rubin's a phenomenal person, but this is so applicable to what we're doing here. I love it. 
Jamil, tech, can you text me that, Jamil, when you get him in? Yeah, I'm happy to. Can you put to. that to Instagram? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I love that. Luis asks, please talk about assignments when it comes to agent. I closed my first double close, and I think I'm going to keep doing that. Please talk about assignments when it comes to agent. I, okay, yeah. No, no. You can totally assign when you're working with an agent. That's not a problem. I, I assign 90% of the agent deals that we do. Um, but if you are going to double close, if you if that's your plan, all that's going to do is keep um, the the HUD separate, the escrow separate. It's going to cost you some extra money, though, Lewis. And so unless you need to double close, unless your contract is non-assignable and you need to double close, I would recommend assigning. OK, assigning is just giving your contractual rights, assigning your contractual rights to your buyer. Now, here's the difficult part about an assignment. You are giving up your rights. And so now your buyer can kind of hijack your situation until close. So here's where it gets tricky. You assign a contract to a buyer that has told you they're not going to perform, or you assign your deal to a buyer that is non-responsive. That is hard because how do you, how do you dial out? How do you, how do you rein in that, that assignment? You can't, they actually have to breach until you can cancel them out mm -hmm. before you can resell the property. So that's where an assignment can bone you. Whereas if you double closed all your deals and somebody's non-responsive, you can breach them out or you can, you can let that person's contract do what it's going to do and, and close that BC at another title company and, 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 and then deal with your buyer who's non-responsive later if you have to. So having doing double yeah. escrows gives you way more control over the process, but it's expensive. I would add to that, um, you know, unless it's required, like it's like Jamil said, it, there's a no assignment clause in your contract, or maybe you're doing it strategically because your assignment fee is really big. Uh, I doubt right. that's the case if it's on market. But really what this is, is it's a mismanagement of relationships, because if you're double closing because you don't want to deal with the agent around your sign, your assignment, then you just need to learn how to have that conversation and once you learn how to have that conversation, then it's not a big deal. Same with cash buyers. You know, I don't have very many cash buyers go squirrely on me because I get a significant non-refundable earnest money. That what are you getting, by the way? What are what? Let's let's talk about that real quick. What's your standard um, EMD right now, non-refundable, Jerry? And then five thousand, and that's five thousand, yeah. and that's on a normal yeah. deal. If it's yeah. a higher price deal, it's 10, 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. high. Yep. yep. Yeah, because but, someone's going to walk from 500 bucks if if they get a better yep. deal. Like a cash buyer will walk from 500 bucks. They're not going to walk from 5,000. So yep. you don't have these cash buyers, you know, backing out of deals when you have significant non-refundable earnest money. And like Jamil said, as long as the contract's assignable, why are you not still doing the assignment? The assignment is the easiest, cleanest method. It's going to get you the biggest net. You're not paying closing fees twice plus transactional funding, right? So I double close a lot, but it's either strategic or I have to. Yeah. It's not because I don't know how to manage an agent or I'm worried about a buyer. Those are the last two reasons why you should be double closing. So I've got uh, buyer sonar with uh, Audantic. Okay. And I've seen Keegley pop up a bunch on closing on deals. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why, what's going on there? So uh, great, great question. So we have been closing on a lot of, uh, a lot of deals. Uh, those are going to be ones that we have, assignability issues. Mm -hmm. uh, those will all also be ones where uh, an agent has said, look, I know you're wholesaling. Mm -hmm. um, I know your company. I see the the the, the chubby man on the internet uh, talking about it all the time. So Not I know more. I, I know who you are. Skinny, skinny um, guy. And so that's, um, that's what uh, that happens, right? And because of that, we will come in, um, no conditions, yeah. non-refundable EMD, close it and then resell. Yep. So that's one of our strategies as well. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that you get to do when you do this business a lot and you start to build a war chest is make aggressive offers. And especially on on market stuff, I mean, God, you go in and make an aggressive offer and close it in 48 hours mm -hmm. and then resell that puppy. Whew. Well, Jer Jerry and I had a nice long conversation um, a week or two ago about um transitioning more to a wholetailing model yeah. you know where you just yeah. close on it you put it right on the market and these would obviously probably be off market right jerry off market oh, yeah. deals. It, it, it won't really work on market because it's already listed at as is value or whatever and you'd be bringing it back to i don't think that's a good play but off market for sure 
Right. And, and that, that one, it gives you the biggest pool of buyers. Yep. Um, because it's going out to the whole world now that it's listed. <clears throat> and two, uh, nobody can, you can close a deal really fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Sometimes when you're working with property owners, they're like, yeah, I got to do, I, I, I want to sell the property, but I need the money to be able to move somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, this is just something that's common. So you're like, okay, well, can I give you the money at the end of the week or, you know, whenever title can close this, the soonest they can, uh, I give you your money and then we do a post possession for 30, 60, 90 days. Right. They really like that. Yeah. And you see a lot of advertising now, whether it be direct mail, whether it be online or whether it be TV and radio that says, hey, sell your house, stay in it until you find your next house, and then you can move to that. Right. 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 And that's really appealing for people that don't want to put it on the market. They don't want people coming through the house. They don't want to do repairs. They're embarrassed. They just they, they want to get rid of this as, as easy as possible. And so um, what I would encourage everybody to do in this in the second phase of your business is learn how to build really great relationships with hard money lenders mm -hmm. so that you can get 90 percent. You could probably in your first year or two get 90 percent covered of the purchase price. Yeah. But as you really start building those relationships, you can get 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Now they might charge you 18 percent. They might charge you a point, um, but you can get upwards to 100 percent of the yeah. purchase price given to you for a six month period. Right. That gives you a lot of flexibility in what you can do. And, but if you can't, and if you don't have that nest egg, learn how to show people your track record of finding great deals. And it makes it so much easier to raise funds from family and friends and associates and people that are interested in what you've got going on. So hey, hey. Hey Jamil, I think I see a comment here that that maybe we're gonna we're gonna win the argument. Zunif, Zunif, Z U N I F eight fifty eight. Pull that up there, Brent. Let me see. And while you're doing that, Brent, I want to just really quickly speak to uh, Julian Jimenez. Says, I'm in SoCal. <laughs> come on, <laughs> come on, Jerry. <laughs> Zunif, hey, first of all, Zunif, come on. Here we go. Hey. <laughs> Hey, I think it's pronounced Zunif. Zunif. Oh, Zunif. Zunif got my first, well, he got his fist deal. Uh, first deal <laughs> two days ago, I took on Jerry's 100 uh, offers challenge. I thought I'd be the first one to prove Jerry wrong, but 72 offers in and everything went right. Now, listen, if, if you're going to keep the deal, fantastic. It's done deal. If you're going to sell that deal, get it sold. If you're going to sign it, get it sold, Zunif. Move heaven and earth to get that thing sold. Amen. So that you can get the proof of concept. Because once you have proof of concept, your life has changed forever. Yep. That's the second stage, I think, in being a real estate entrepreneur. Number one is find your community, find your tribe, find people that are doing this, find a connection, whether it be a RIA, a real estate investor association, whether it be a, a bigger pockets meetup, whether it be mentorship, whether it be whatever it is find people doing this business and number two do your first deal and get proof of concept yep because yep. once that happens and uh, and Zunif, it's, been, it's been it's been two days like our, my goal is to dispo a deal in 48 hours like if i either have a deal or i don't have yep. a deal if you're pushing that baby hard you should know if you got a deal right yes so yes um uh, julian jimenez uh i want to i want to speak to this because i think we can diagnose the issue here he says he's in um San Diego, I have good buyers with reasonable ROI expectations, but I get bit out, but I still get outbid all of the time. Can't mm -hmm. figure out why. Mm -hmm. Julian, it's because you're going after freshly listed MLS properties in Southern California. Okay. That is always going to be highly competitive. And if it's well priced, that means it's going to get bid up. And if you're coming in at list or not going in over list, because that let's just face it in SoCal, the actual buyer, the end buyer is who you're competing against, yeah. not other wholesalers. You're competing against the actual end buyer who's going to come in non-refundable over list closing in three, four days. And that's why you're getting beat. Julian, switch your strategy from freshly listed on market properties mm -hmm. to properties that are on the market that are 30, 60, 90, 120 days. Now you've got motivation now you've got the obviously they're overpriced but you've got an opportunity now to come in and actually negotiate and because it'll be overpriced 
you're going to show your buyer how well you did in your negotiation when you locked that thing up 100, 150,000 less than list price. So switch your strategy, Julian, from freshly listed MLS properties in Southern California to, uh, to on market properties that have been uh, marinating on the MLS. And I think your problem will be solved. What do you guys think? Yeah, Julian, that's a top five market in like the world. You know what I mean? Like there's only a certain amount of land and the whole world wants a piece of that land in San Diego. It's just yeah. a fact. Yeah. So, yes. you know, I would highly suggest exactly what Jamil is saying. Yeah. In addition, go after vacant lots, drive them for dollars, be obsessed with the roughest looking properties in that area and build a relationship with every single one of those property owners. And I would include a uh, small multifamily in those. That's where I've seen the biggest success with the uh, people that I've worked with in San Diego. Yeah, I would I would say, Julian, you know, like I might still call, but my approach and my expectations are going to be very different based on what Jamil said. So the conversation with that agent isn't like, hey, I want to make an offer thinking I might get this deal. You're not. You're going to get out bid like Jamil said. But maybe what you're doing, maybe what you say to that agent is you say, hey, look, I'm a cash investor. I'm looking to build a relationship. I'm looking to do uh, 15 deals this year in this market. Can we work together? Can you call me when you get stuff like this? Maybe we yeah. can work out a cash deal before. Cherry pick it before they list it, right, it's Jerry? Like, it's the next time conversation. Yeah. yeah, so have the next time conversation with that agent still. But just know going in like, hey, and I might even still make the offer. I might say, I say stuff like this all the time. I say, hey, you know what? My offer is probably embarrassingly low. Are you sitting down? You know, I'll, I'll ease into it, right? And I might still say, man, I would have to be at X knowing that there's no way in heck they're going to take that because it's highly competitive. But the point, though, is that you're having a conversation and you're clear about what's going on. Like, you got to be aware of your surroundings in this business. You can't think you can call a clean property listed on the MLS and it just came out and think that you have a very high chance of getting that deal. You have a very low chance. And there's other approaches that are going to yield you a better return or play the long game and still make the connection, still have the conversation. But your objective now is the relationship, not the deal. Yeah, I feel like on market in San Diego is like walking into like Tiffany's, the jewelry store and, and start haggling with them on price. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, They're not going to, they're not going to haggle with you on price, you know, <laughs> but if you find out, you know, who supplies the diamonds, you find out who supplies the metal, you find out, start building some relationships, you might have something there, but I mean, it's, the, there's just, there's a premium and premium spots. I, I do I mean? follow. I mean, I do follow a policy and um, I've, healed, I've heard Jamil teach us a little bit differently, so it's not right or wrong, but I try to follow this, this rule of thumb where uh, I never discriminate my offer based on list price, meaning um, I don't even pay attention to list price. My number's what it is and I'm going to call, I'm going to, I'm there anyway, I'm talking to the agent and I want to get in the habit of making offers. I, I see too many people, they get just gun shy about the offer price and they're embarrassed because it's a lot lower. And so then they don't do it. And then they're not exercising that muscle of making low offers. Instead, like, I'm just so natural about it. I, I, and I do it in a way to where no one's offended, you know, because I ease into it or I joke around about it. But guys, don't be afraid to make a low offer on an overpriced property. You just but not but I, I I'm it. I'm okay making a low offer on an overpriced property, just not day one of the listing. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's that's, that's that's where I teach yeah. it differently. I, I yeah. 100 percent align with you, Jerry, in that. Uh, make make di what you think is a disrespectful offer. It's not disrespectful, it's the right offer. Yeah. If a house is sitting on the market 90 days, doesn't have uh an it hasn't sold. The market rejected the the list price. That's what it did. It rejected list price. So let's not beat around the bush there. That's an overpriced home. But Definitely. when it's first day on market and it's overpriced and you're going in with a hundred thousand dollar low offer, they're not going to yeah. be able to explain that to their seller, and they're not going to be able to explain to their seller why they're bringing them a hundred thousand dollar low uh, lower offer day one. That agent's just going to look bad presenting that to their seller, and so I think that conversation not even just, gonna do it. it's not going to yeah. it's not going to work. It's moot. You you yeah. shouldn't do that. You should give it time, let it sit, let it percolate for a while, and then let the market reject the price. Then go in with your hundred thousand dollar under list price offer. Give it some time to sit there. Yeah. Let them think about the mistake they made in pricing it there. Yeah. Uh, Noel asks, Hey guys, any tips to get my first deal on the big Island of Hawaii? Jerry, what do you think, bud? 
I mean, we treat Hawaii like any, I mean, no different than anywhere else. It's mm -hmm. all about the same thing, right? You got to talk to a lot of people. You got to source and find deals and make offers. I mean, they're doing deals in Hawaii just like they are anywhere else. So I, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't treat it really any different than anywhere else. I totally agree. Yeah. I would find, I would find the ugliest properties there. I would find the most, I would find all the vacant lots. I would find anybody that's owned property for a long time there. You can, you can really pull those lists and, um, and I would reach out to them. If you, if you have a budget, um, I would probably do direct mail, but make sure that you answer your phones live. And then once you really have a budget, I would do PPC and just go bananas. In the smaller market, I mean, if you really hone in pay-per-click in, in major mm -hmm. markets especially, but in, in smaller markets as well, it is it is powerful when people reach out. But remember, anytime an inbound call comes in, you answer it live. Answer it live. You or somebody on your staff, somebody internal. I'm telling you, if you get like a if, if you get some sort of call service, it's not gonna work. If you just let it go to voicemail and call them back, they're gonna call somebody else. You got to treat it like the the roof is leaking and they need a roofer over ASAP, right? That's the mentality that you have to have when it comes to uh, inbound leads. But uh, if you're going outbound leads where you're being really proactive, you're reaching out to them, find the ugliest properties over there and uh, make sure that you, you you talk to all those property owners. Find some way to communicate with them, right? Awesome. Uh, great questions. Here we go. Our favorite. Oh, Joel, what up? What up, bro? How do you get the low ball offer across to agents? How do you go for no with agents compared to sellers? So, Joel, first... I never frame my offer as a low ball offer. I, I always say this is a hundred percent of as is mm -hmm. right. I'm, I'm only going it after is. it is a hundred percent of as is value. the buyer and I'm going and at an as is property, a house in, in, in disrepair or original condition. I'm going to pay you exactly what I think it's worth in its current condition and a hundred, I'll pay you a hundred percent of what it's worth in its current condition. And so, um, I don't, it's not low ball. It's just lower than list. I think we have to reframe it in our brain. So many, so many of you are being frozen in, 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 in action, thinking you're low balling. You're not, it's lower than list. It's not low ball. Okay. And lower than list is because list is high. So your yeah. lower than this, list is just a hundred percent of as is. Reframe the way you think about this. We're we're a free market society. Correct? correct. On some level, right? On on most <laughs> levels, most most. That's of the level, idea. I, I, won't, I won't get I won't get into it with you, Jerry. But um, so that means us as buyers get to go out and offer whatever we feel we want to pay. For whatever that property is. Correct. For, for, for whatever we want for that property. Yes. Right? Just let that sink in for a second. Let it sink in. Right? All the prices that you see at the stores, you choose to pay that. Right? You choose that. And if you don't buy it, and if you, it doesn't get bought. And eventually that product will disappear from the shelves. And it goes where? Clearance. 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 Right? And, and, and that is like, it is so powerful to understand that, that price is not fixed by the government. Price is not fixed by real estate agents or appraisers or banks or the, the uh, property taxes, whatever. It, it's still government. So I doubled that one. But like, there's nobody determining yeah. that but a ready, willing, and able buyer. And I, I think I think what happens all That's the time crazy too thing. is- yep. This is what I see happen. I think where something like this comes across as a concern is, okay, it comes out, you, you're talking to the agent, you're going to make your offer, you make your offer, the agent says, oh, I know for a fact the seller won't take that offer. They already said no to a higher offer. Raise your yeah. hand if you've had them say that, right? And so what the agent is basically saying to you, now put yourself, think about this. What the agent is basically saying, saying to you is, I know the seller's motivation. I know their bottom line. And I'm going to make a decision on behalf of the seller. Now, that's false. Even if the seller said no to a higher offer yesterday, what we know about motivation is it changes monthly, weekly, daily, and hourly. And so I don't ever assume that an agent actually knows the motivation level or the bottom line of the seller. So I'll say to that agent, I'll say, look, 
you know, I totally get it. You're probably totally right. But hey, would it be okay if you just called and did a verbal to the seller? I know you said they already said no to a higher offer. I get that. But it's sitting here still. It hasn't sold. Jamil said make offers if they're over 120 days old. And this one's been here 150 days. What do you think about just calling the seller and letting them know you have a cash offer here for X? And I'll say to the agent, I'll say, and by the way, if anything, it will help you get a price reduction and sell this yeah. property at some point yep. in time. It'll help you because Great now point. the seller is going to see multiple low offers and maybe they'll come down on price. Wouldn't it be in your best interest? It only take a few minutes. Like I'm having this conversation with a seller. And what I'm trying to say in a nice way is I'm trying to say to the seller, you don't actually know the seller's motivation. You think you do. You have a reasonable cause to believe you do. But until an offer is put in front of a seller, you don't know if the seller will take it until they get that offer in front of them. And that's when you actually find out what they'll take. Yep. And, you know, to Jerry's point, recently I sold a, a property in South Phoenix where I had a partner on it and we had an offer in the first week at, at a certain price. It was like 380. I wanted to take it. My partner was like, no, that's too low. And I'm like, let's just take it. Bird in the hand. This is a very strong offer. Let's take it. She said, no, no, because we were listed at 399 now. Uh, and so what ended up happening? The 380 went away. Time went. And um, we had one seller fall out of escrow. We had another person um, not be able to qualify for the loan. Mm -hmm. And then we finally ended up taking 360. I was all, yeah, I was always yeah. told being a real right. estate agent for a while in the level markets, 80% of the time, your first offer is going to be your highest. I love you. I always, I, and that always stuck out to me because I always tried to fight it. Yeah. I, I know that because yeah. I was doing flips, right? Yep. And I, I've done, I don't know, 100, 120 flips. And you always want to get the most out of every single one, especially if it's a new listing. You're like, ah, I don't know. You know, they came in a little under under the list price. I think that we'll get some more offers, blah, 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 blah. Let's extend this thing out. Yeah. And then no other offers come in. Yeah. So, Jerry, I was just saying, we, I was always taught in, in, um, in the brokerages that in a in a in an average market in a normal market kind of uh not going too crazy either way 80 percent of the time your first offer is your highest right yeah yeah, yeah i mean I, I i want to throw one more uh one more analogy out there that i think we we, we need to we need to keep in mind i like looking at my offers with agents as a tennis match okay okay so I look at my first offer and I'm talking, you know, a house that's on the market 30, 60, 90 days, not original, not, not first day on market. Okay. I'm talking, it's had some time markets already rejected price. So I give my offer. So let's say my offer is hundred grand below list and it's immediately rejected mm -hmm. to me. That's first serve. Okay. The rejection is the volley. a volley back. Mm -hmm. Okay. I give it two weeks. I reach back out to that agent and I say, hey, I noticed the property is still available. You guys haven't been able to sell it yet. Do you think that the seller is ready to negotiate and accept the price that is in line with its condition? That is volley back. Mm -hmm. And we do this over and over again until the house is sold. Until the house is sold, you are in the tennis match, guys. And these tennis matches can last weeks, months, sometimes even six months, the whole time, the entirety of the listing. So please stop taking a rejection of your offer as the end of the game. It's not. It's only the return of service. Okay? Use that analogy and, like, burn it into your brain. You're playing tennis here, and these matches can take weeks and months sometimes to play out. And that's on and off market. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Jerry, can you explain what Jerry's hundred offer challenge is? Cow. Yeah. Real simple. Five offers a day, twenty-five a week, a hundred a month. Now, to qualify, it can be a verbal or a written, mm -hmm. uh, and it has to be an original offer. So it can't be a follow-up from you know yesterday or whatever. So five new property offers a day. You could do more than that. So you could do ten a day. But the point is, is in 30 days, you should be able to make 100 offers and you will get a deal. If you just make 100 offers and you put a number in front of an agent 
the numbers are the, these numbers work with off market too. They might be a little different, but the point is, is like just be consistent, do it every day. I look at it like this. If you did nothing else today, but you got your five offers out, you had a great day. Like you're doing the right thing. Instead, what we do is we find reasons why we're busy. We're doing this. I'm working on my CRM. You know, I'm getting some business cards made or whatever things everyone says they're doing. And they're not actually doing anything productive. The most productive thing you could do in this business, nothing happens until you put an offer in front of somebody. Until that point in time, everything is a waste of time or like not a good use of time. It's all leading up to an offer in yep. front of a seller. Yep. And until you do that, you will never get deals or grow this business. Well, and that's how you learn, right? You know, it's the whole, people think it's education plus action equals results. It's the action and the re, plus the results equals your education. It's yeah. an absolute <laughs> fact. It is. Yeah, I mean, I like that. That, we, we, you have to flip it all the way around. Yeah. And it's also, well, I won't even get into the the profit and income and expenses, but you know, <laughs> when you're getting started, it's just, again, massive, imperfect action. That's why we have a rhinoceros as our, as our uh, mascot, because it's just, don't overthink, just charge towards one goal at a time until you achieve it. And this is, this is coming from a, a, a great book called rhinoceros success, which has been out for a long time. And, uh, which is really cool because my grandma gave me this that she had from 1985. Wow. That's my inheritance from my grandma. They cleared out her house. Yeah. She lives in the assisted living yeah. uh, house, um, next to me. And, uh, they gave me a Ziploc bag of my inheritance and it's rhinoceros success <laughs> 1985. Isn't that great? Yeah. So look, I just opened it up to this and yeah. it says a rhinoceros charges with singleness of purpose. All of your energy is directed towards the attainment of one burning desire. Mm -hmm. The reason you are so dangerous is because once you set yourself charging at something, nothing will distract you. Mm -hmm. You never charge at two things at once. You concentrate on getting your first target and then you fix your concentration on your next goal. Boom. Boom. There you go. Right to the page, man. Right to the that's page. Great. God wanted you all to hear that. Dude, Brent, that's like divine that that was that was Isn't given that to you and the rhinos like your mascot. That's pretty, know. That's pretty wild. I thought that that was absolutely incredible when, when, uh, the see, you, don't, you know, see, you thought you want, you thought you needed like millions of dollars in inheritance and all you needed was that book. That's it. That's it. My grandma name. knew. Grandma knew. Grandma, grandma knew. knew. Yeah. Grandma knew. That's yeah it. She gave all the money to your siblings, not you. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. To my, yeah. My mom and her, uh, her siblings, but, um, <laughs> No, it's uh, it's the absolute truth. You know, I think we overthink it too much. I think that uh, again, it goes to those twenty points, and I'm really, I'm really excited when you post that to Instagram. I want to take a snapshot and keep that. I, I it's brilliant. I mean, so you much. know, as I as I went through and I looked at all of those twenty that I and I will, guys, I will post that and I'll send it to you guys as well. Please share it with your communities because those twenty, those twenty points, that's what gets us stuck in the mud. That's what gets us stuck in the mud. It's one of those, it's of the 20 that I said, one of those is stopping you. One of those is why you're not where you want to be in your life right now. One of those is what's holding you back and blocking you from all of your blessings. So the key here is to be real enough with yourself to identify which of the 20, there may be multiple in the 20, but what, of those 20 is blocking you and then get to the underlying reason that you're letting that happen and then step outside of it. Look, we, as long as we're aware of our problem, we can start solving our problem, but it, it but self-awareness and self-honesty guys, it's so important. It's so important. You please don't gas yourself up on BS. And I'll, I'll tell you the best way, and this is just for me personally, that I have found to get past some of those things that you're talking about. Yeah. Some of those, uh, that list of 20 is being around people that have already mastered that. Yes. Being around other people that aren't, uh, aren't afraid to take hey, Christian. action. Aren't afraid Christian, to go. Janelle said hi. hi. Let me say hi to him real quick and then go back, back to bed. Hi. Okay. He can't there see you. Hi. Hi. How you hey. doing, buddy? Good to see hey. you. Welcome good. to the show. I'm good. Your dad's doing awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's he's sleeping. <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> okay. Nobody talks. Okay, go wait for me. I'll come tuck you Love in. Love you, buddy. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Uh, the best way to find a phone number for off-market property owners that are hard to find. Um, I like cyberbackgroundchecks.com. Ooh. Cyberbackgroundchecks.com. Okay. Uh, they've got some paid features that can get real deep dive okay. into it. Yep. And um, yeah, that, that's a good one. I my uh the that and I'm I sorry I'm not trying to self promote but I'm just saying the Doctor Deal Junkie yeah. Skip Tracing yeah. it's so it's flipping gangster. good it's gangster guys mm -hmm. like I'm sorry I I have so much love and appreciation for our friends at Batch I have so much love and appreciation for our friends at PropStream but I don't know what happened to the Skip Tracing there I don't know I I have no idea what happened because it's like I I I did a live um using Skip Tracing from one of the platforms I'm not going to say which one it was. One of those two. And for an entire hour, I got wrong number, wrong number, Beep. wrong number, wrong number, disconnected. Well, Jerry knows Jerry's Jerry's uh, got he's he's baked it into prop wire. You can essentially get what free skip tracing, essentially. Right? Yeah. Twenty twenty five hundred for ninety seven dollars a month. Twenty five hundred wow. a month for ninety seven dollars a month. Yeah. Is wow. a promo we're doing with prop wire gold. But. Yeah. I, and I would say, I mean, one thought I'm having here too with this question is uh, tell me what you guys think about this, but, um, you know, always think about your time, energy and effort and opportunity costs. So I see a lot of people where they'll chase a lead and they'll, they'll keep chasing a lead, chasing a lead, chasing a lead when they could have found a hundred other leads and done a deal in the same time they're trying to, Oh my you know, goodness. I they'll find this so frustrating when it's like, you know, Definitely make an effort, but then at some point, like, hey, the time you're spending chasing that dead lead, you could have found a bunch more good leads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, why Why are you so hyper-focused? You know what it is, Jerry? It goes back to one of those 20, right? That they, it got difficult for them, and so they're stuck, and they're, they've, made a, they've made a mental decision. I'm not moving on. And unless I can sell this deal, I'm not going to continue doing this. I'm not going to try again. I'm not going to do any more work. I don't want to do any more work. This deal has to sell or this deal has to go or I quit. Yeah, it's and a that's, it's a that's what it is, man. And it's a scarcity. So the scarcity is, hey, I might not be able to find another opportunity. So I better hang on to this dead lead that's not going anywhere rather than abundance is like, hey, there's a thousand more opportunities right around the corner. And I'm going to find a better one anyway. You know, like it's a different mindset to think abundantly about lead gen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and think of like gift yourself the, the respect of your time, right? Like have, and I think that's a self-worthiness thing, right? Like you've got to be able to say to yourself, what am I worth? What is my, what is, what do what, what am I worth per hour? What do I, what, am I, am I worth doing more or getting more of course you are all of us are but if you are if you don't think you're worth it then you're not going to give yourself the effort right Ro roland says your garbage can is your best friend yeah, yeah. dude you're right mm -hmm. talk about your uh summit it's coming up april 23rd 24th and 25th guys the squad up summit actually um i'm tomorrow I do a, a virtual happy hour on my uh, YouTube page. Um, so on my YouTube channel tomorrow, I'm going to give away uh, a few free tickets. So come to the virtual happy hour. If you haven't been able to buy a ticket yet for squad up summit and you have, you know, a, a financial thing that's holding you back from attending, uh, I'm going to give away some tickets tomorrow for free so that you can make it. So whoever hasn't yet gotten a ticket, if you're, it's the, we're at the tail end here. I've got a few extra, you know, back pocket tickets that I can give away. Come to my YouTube channel tomorrow at, at uh, four o'clock Pacific. Mm -hmm. And we'll be, um, we'll be selecting who's going to get the free ticket. So awesome. please come check that out. Yep. Jerry, what do you got going on? What are you dropping this week? Um, well, we're, we're doing, uh, some, some new episodes of the watch me wholesale show that Let's I, go. I used to do that for a while. I did 30 some episodes of that and then got away from it, but we're going to be starting that back up. We've got another, like the first one coming back here in a few days, I think. Come so on. I'm super excited about that. That's a lot of fun. It's basically randomly selecting a market, going there and find an opportunity, call and make an offer 
all in like 30 minutes. So just to show that guys, we're, you don't have to overcomplicate this. Like there's opportunity all around you and you can do this and here's what it looks like. So that'd be kind of, that's a kind of a fun thing we're doing this week. Yeah. Super cool. I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to show up to Jerry's, uh, um, watch me wholesale and just watch you dude. Like that. I bet you you're so good. That'll be so entertaining and also educational at the same time. What, a, what an awesome, what an awesome show. What about you? I'll Brent? Have you, you come on, on? Maybe, maybe you can come on and do one with me, Jamil. That'd I'd love fun. to Jerry. I'd love, love to do one with you. Let's make it happen. Okay. I'm, I'm flying to Augusta to the masters. You're going to the masters. Yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with uh, my whole family. Hey, so it's uh, yeah, it's going to cool. be really exciting. I'm I'm truly not like a golf guy, so yeah. But apparently, this is something my dad wanted to go to for a long time, so we're going to make it happen. How much were the tickets? They were they were. I mean, they're seventeen twenty thousand dollars. There's not uh, they're not tickets. They're no. badges. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. They get dropped off every night to yeah. our Airbnb. Okay. Each night before. Yeah. To make sure that we didn't break any rules the day before that day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's it's a wild thing. So I don't if you know. break a rule, they don't give you your like, ticket. Uh, what's that? If you break a rule, you don't get tomorrow's ticket. Yeah, exactly. That's one wow. way to make you behave. <laughs> wow! Please, nobody take this wrong. But the money, the amount of money you white people will spend on sports yeah. like golf is hilarious. <laughs> hilarious! Me. I just think it's so Jamil, good. When are you, when are you coming to so Puerto good. Rico? When Pardon me. To, when are you coming to Puerto Rico? I need to come, bro. I got to get out there. I, I, I'm. I mean, I think sometime in the summer, I want to come out and hang out with you. Like Brent, I'm you literally, I'm contemplating moving to Puerto Rico. Yeah. Because I'm going to pay $1.3 million to the IRS for 20 uh, for 2023. Like, that's what I feel right now. When I'm looking at my tax bill, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, Why I am I here? Why am I here? Yeah. I got to move to Puerto Rico and be, what, what, I would have paid, what, 3% tax? Four. No, no, it's not. It's not you three. Dude, it's four. On, what no. am I doing? What am I doing here? 1.3 million dollars, Brent. Listen, that means you did pretty well. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Can I mean, I'd rather make I'd that. rather make money and pay taxes than not make money and not pay taxes, but there come on, go. man. There you go. But come That's on, you got to you got to come to Puerto Rico. Absolutely. We're going to we're going to take a trip to Puerto let's go to, Rico. Let's go to let's go to we're Puerto so Puerto Rico, Rico. Save some taxes. <laughs> there we go. And hang out with the Nortons. Thank you guys. You could have chosen to be anywhere tonight, but you spent the time with us. We truly appreciate it. There's four clicks that you need to do to subscribe to Jerry Norton, Jamil Damji, Pace Morby, and Brent Daniels YouTube channel. We come at, we, we're here every Monday night and then we're putting out stuff pretty much every single day to give you the instruction you need. Everybody has a different pull to a different personality and a different approach. So make sure that you find yours and, and uh, let us help you out. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Or just say squat up. So squat up and enjoy the show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. So, so squat, squat up and enjoy the show. <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't say that thing. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I okay. Forgot. So squat up and enjoy the show! Cool. <laughs> I think we should use the one where Jamil doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs>